Let's start this video with a question. If you had to categorize a business as a legacy business, how many years should the business be running for? 50 years, 100 years, or more? Whatever your answer, the company we're talking about today can certainly be classified as a legacy business. The Hudson's Bay Company is a continuously running 350-year-old business set up in 1670. Just think about that. The company is a century older than the United States of America. In fact, it is the oldest company in North America. Today, we might know it as a retail chain conglomerate, but Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, started as a fur trading business. In this video, we will discuss how HBC adapted and remained relevant for over five centuries and where it finds itself today. The Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, was set up because of the determination of two traders wanting to make a name for themselves in the fur business. Imagine this. You are a European living in the 17th century. You cross the Atlantic Ocean and find out how big fur trading is. You cultivate a relationship with the natives, and through them, you learn that there is an unexplored territory to the north which can provide a lot of fur. That is what happened with two French traders, Radisson and Grosselier. They began preparation to set off towards this unexplored land. Making money in the 17th century sounds like one big scary adventure, doesn't it? Despite bringing back good quality fur, they were arrested and their furs were detained by French authorities who were in control of the fur trade. After this failure, they began doing something that's common in modern day business circles, networking. They eventually received backing from none other than King Charles II of England. In 1668, one of the two ships that set sail for Hudson Bay from England reached its destination. A new trade route for furs was opened. The Hudson Bay Company was now in business. Through a royal charter, the company was granted an area of 1.5 million square miles of territory to explore. Once HBC got to work, they put in place some simple strategies. To get the most out of an unfamiliar piece of land, it is crucial to get the natives on board. So if you were to come across an employee of the HBC in the 17th century, there is a good chance that they would be well versed in the native way of living. Learning the native customs and language was encouraged. Although marrying a local was strictly forbidden for a while, the company employees continued doing it regardless. Befriending the locals gave them an advantage over other competitors. Locals knew the land and were better at trapping furry animals. Despite frequent fights with the French, business continued to grow and HBC established multiple outposts in their territory. Through the 1700s, the British and French were involved in the closest thing to global war anyone had seen till then. By the time the war ended, the British were the dominant force in North America. Hudson's Bay Company benefited directly from this. With the French control limited, HBC's main competition was the Northwest Company, or the NWC. HBC and NWC competed fiercely during the 19th century. These times were such that if you were business rivals, the most likely way to settle any dispute would be war. Fighting between the two companies created a disturbance for business. This was such a big issue that the British government stepped in and forced the two to merge. An efficient way to resolve a dispute, isn't it? This new HBC enjoyed a monopoly over its territories. Anyone wanting to get into the fur trading business needed a license from them. By the 1850s, other settlers in the area became aware of the company's unfair dominance. Soon after this, a law court decided not to fine a fur trader who was dealing in fur without an HBC license. This verdict opened doors for other traders, and the monopoly HBC had enjoyed was over. This period was one of even greater change for HBC. The fur trade was declining because the taste of customers was changing. Ah, fashion. Manufacturers of hats and coats were switching to cheaper materials. On top of this, the British government decided to hand over most of the land HBC had controlled for 200 years to Canada in 1869. The company was compensated for this. HBC's legacy is one of adaptability and survival. They dealt with this flurry of changes and transformed into their modern version, a retail giant. From the inception of the company till the 1870s, a lot had changed in terms of demography and how the world functioned. Settlements had started to spring up in many areas which had once been sparsely populated. 
More settlements meant a better economy and a rise in demand for general merchandise. Canada was much better connected via railroads and shipping routes. HBC turned their outposts into general stores to meet the demands of the local population. Their first sales shop opened its doors in 1857 in Fort Langley. In 1881, they released their first mail-order catalog. By 1902, they had nine successful general stores, and by 1910, the retail business was big enough that HBC split the company into three divisions, the fur trade, the retail stores, and the land sales division. In 1913, the retail division of the company opened its first departmental store in Calgary. Within 13 years of this, they had set up another five of these big retail outlets. In 1926, HBC also entered into the oil and gas business to diversify. Despite this, the retail stores remained the biggest part of the business. After a few successful decades in retail, the company was ready to expand further into Canada. Fun fact, HBC's headquarters remained in England for 300 years. They were finally shifted to Winnipeg in 1970. From here on, the story of HBC gets a little haphazard. A series of acquisitions through the 1960s and 70s left the company debt burdened. They acquired Morgan's, Simpson's, ShopRite, and other stores. HBC expanded ShopRite to 65 locations. HBC wasn't done with acquisitions just yet. In 1978, when Zeller's Discount Stores attempted a takeover of HBC, HBC turned the tables and acquired Zeller's. The strategy through the 1960s and 70s seemed to be one of eliminating competition by acquiring them. All of this expansion came at a cost. HBC was now burdened with debt. In 1979, Kenneth Thompson acquired a controlling stake in the company and set off on a mission to make the company leaner. Oil and gas, financial services, and some other operations of HBC were sold off. By 1987, most of its wholesale business and fur business was sold too. With the funds raised, HBC acquired more retail chains. Kmart Canada was purchased and merged with Zellers. The idea was to make the core business stronger. But today, HBC is a business that is struggling to survive. How did it get here? According to me, HBC had to tackle three major problems. Firstly, too many acquisitions confused the company. Apart from the money aspect, acquisitions are successful only if the logic behind them is sound. For example, ShopRite was a catalog store. It had limited stock and orders were taken through catalogs. After purchase, the chain was expanded to 65 locations from just four locations before the takeover. The model didn't work and by 1982, the chain was shut down. There didn't seem to be a clear synergy behind the acquisitions. Between the early 2000s and 2019, HBC made multiple acquisitions, but eventually had to sell them all because of underperformance and financial pressures. The second problem was the frequent change in ownership. HBC was acquired in 1979, then in 2006 by Jerry Zucker, and then in 2008 by NRDC Equity Partners. The visions of these different owners were different and put the company under pressure. In March 2020, HBC became a privately owned company and its strategic vision changed once again. The third and most important concern was the rise of online and offline retail giants in Canada. Walmart entered Canada in 1994 and changed the department store game. By 1997, Walmart controlled a 45% share of the discount store market. HBC tried to use Zellers as the chain to compete with Walmart, but the plan failed because Walmart was more aggressive than them. Zellers stores were then leased out to Target Canada. While the retail stores lost out to Walmart, HBC's online business couldn't compete against Amazon. The current ownership of HBC wants to bring back the Zeller's name through online and offline stores. As of 2023, HBC still runs 200 plus stores and employs several thousand people. Along with the retail business, their real estate wing continues to survive. But the company's existence today is more fragile than it has ever been. But if there is one thing we have learned about HBC, it is that the company knows how to adapt. After all, few businesses can boast of existing across five centuries. What do you think? Will the future of Hudson's Bay Company be as successful as the past? Or is this the final challenge in HBC's history? 
Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We love hearing from you. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more interesting content on some of your favorite companies. And hit that bell icon so that you're notified every time we drop a fresh video. See you next time.